Father, we just come before you this morning. God, we are grateful to be in your house. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that um, we can gather without fear of persecution. Lord, that we can worship you freely, Jesus. And, you know, we just ask as, you know, we come into this, to this place, this building this morning, Lord, to meet with you, Jesus. God, we pray that you would meet with us, even as that, that last song was singing, pour out your spirit, pour out your spirit. We need you, Father. We need your spirit, Jesus. So come and illuminate our hearts and our minds to receive the word that you have for us individually, Father. And let us be, as, as James says, not just a hearer, but a doer of the word. Lord, may we, may we walk out these doors applying the word that you've spoken to us. We pray that you would just speak to us eternal life, Jesus, and, and that we would walk out looking a little more, more like you, Jesus. We don't want to look like ourselves. So we pray, God, that we would look more like you, Jesus. Sanctify us, Lord, purify us. We thank you that your word is alive. Lord, it's, it's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, God. So here we are. We pray that you would just come and meet with us, Lord, that you would do business, that you would show us those areas in our life that, that we need to surrender, that we need to change, maybe those areas that we need to repent of, God, and you know, or maybe the areas that we need to be encouraged and challenged, Father. So build us up in our most holy faith today, Father. We love you, we thank you, and we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, so life's all-time greatest question you know, many of you, you might have your own life's all-time greatest question, and I think, you know, it'll vary. It'll change based on the season of life that you're in. You know, if you ask 10 different people out there, hey, what is your life's all-time greatest question from 10 different people, you're probably going to get 10 different answers, 10 completely different answers. That's because all of us are at different stages in life. All of us are going through a different season. There, there, there are different things that we are all experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis that will affect what our life's greatest question is. So maybe, you know, I don't know many of you, maybe um, there might be some in here or you have known somebody like this who their friends are all of a sudden getting married. They're moving out of their house. Maybe they got their career job. Maybe they, maybe they first bought their house, and, and you're kind of at that place, and you're just kind of asking the question, and your life's all-time greatest question is this. Man, who am I going to marry? <laughs> when is life going to start happening for me? I've been on dates. They, they, they seem serious, but the, late, the girl dumped me. You know, or, or man, I'm just stuck in this routine. When is my life going to get started? And, and that's a very real and valid question at the stage of life that you're in. Maybe there's others in here or maybe that you know that are finishing high school. And your, your life's greatest question is, man, where, do I, where should I go to college? What should I spend the next four years of my life studying? You know, I felt like, you know, I want to be a teacher since I was very young. Should I go and study liberal arts or elementary education? Maybe, maybe there's some that had just graduated college. And now you're kind of at the place where your life's all-time greatest question is, man, I just I spent four years studying liberal arts. You know, I always wanted to be a kindergarten teacher, but now I'm not so sure. What am I going to commit the next 30 plus years of my life doing? Do I really want to be a teacher? Do 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 I think that job is going to bring fulfillment? Am I going to be happy? Is it going to provide for my needs? Or worse yet, is that job that I commit to for the next 35 plus years, am I going to hate that job? Am I going to come home at night dreading going to bed because I know I have to wake up the next morning to a job that I hate? That's your life's greatest question in that season of life. Now, maybe many of you are past the high school, the college, you're already married, and your life's greatest question may look like this. You might have a wayward child, right? You have raised this child up, whether it's your son or daughter, you've raised them up in a house that loves Jesus, that serves Jesus, that honors Jesus. You took them to church. They were involved in you know, youth group and, and high school camps and summer camps. Some of their best friends were at church. They just loved church. But now they're off at college. 
And they find themselves stuck in the world. They're in this trap and they want nothing to do with Jesus. They don't believe in God anymore. They think you as a parent, you're foolish for believing that because the secular university system, they have an agenda. It's an anti-God agenda. agenda. And that's what's infiltrating the next generation. And, and you as a parent, your life's all-time greatest question is this. Will my child be okay? Will they find their way back to the Lord before it's too late? Will something tragic happen? You know, this past year and a half has been devastating for families. You know, even for our church, Maranatha Chapel, you know, we've done more funerals in the past year and a half than we have probably in the last five or six years. From people that have overdosed on fentanyl, you know, and all kinds of different, you know, situations. And, and it's been a very difficult year. And a lot of kids are finding themselves in this trap. And these are all very, very real life questions. They're important questions. And these questions need to be bathed in prayer. You need to go before the altar of God to, to petition, right? To intercede, to ask God for wisdom so you can help navigate, so you have answers to these questions. So your life's all-time greatest question will change. It will ebb and flow based on your situation, based on the season of life that you find yourself in. But one thing is for sure, as a Christian, as a believer in Jesus Christ, you have been filled and indwelt with the Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity. God now lives inside of you. And if, and if, and if you are not sure that you're a Christian, come talk to me afterwards. I would love to share the message of the gospel and what to do to, to get eternal life. But for us who, who are believers, Bible believers, who trust the Lord, that love the Lord, we have a life's all-time greatest question that transcends whatever reason that, or whatever season of life that we find ourselves in. No matter what's going on in, in the world, we have one life's all-time greatest question. And we all want the answer to that question. What is the answer to that question? And, and it, may take, it may take some believers a very long time to find the answer to this question. And sadly, there are even Christians in the church that will never, ever find the answer to this question. They will just be walking in circles until they go meet the Lord. So what is this life's all-time greatest question? You know, we all want the answer to this question. What, what is it? Well, it's been said, you know, if there's a survey that's been conducted within a large group of people, this is not just Christians. This is all of humanity, humankind. This study or this poll, if you ask people, what is life's greatest question for you? There are three common questions that, that people answer with. And the first one is this. The first question is, where did we come from? Where did we come from? You don't have to have a, you know, a degree to figure out the answer to that question. You know, many, many people in this world, they don't know the answer to that question. They look around, they see all of this order, this, this beautiful system, this ecosystem that's thriving, that there's life, there's love, there's happiness. Where did we come from? Right? And if you go ask uh, the university professor, what answer are you going to get? Well, you see, we, we have all of this order. All of this life, this, this love that's happening, it's because millions of years ago, there was a big cosmic glue that all of a sudden blew up, right? And now we have this order. That's their answer. That's not very logical. But as a believer, as a Christian, we know where to turn to to find the answer to these questions. Where did we come from? We can go back to the first book of the Bible, Genesis. Genesis is the book of the beginnings. And you could read in the first couple of chapters the story of the creation. That there was nothing. God spoke and there was everything. So God created us. Where did we come from? You came from God. So that's the first question. Where did we come from? The second question that is often asked, is there life after death? Is there life after death? You know, and I think all people wrestle with this question because God has placed eternity in our hearts. There, there's a void that's, that's, that's been missing. If you don't know Jesus, there's a void in your heart that longs to have an answer to this question, is there life after death? 
Some people think, you know, no, when you, when you die, you're just done. There's annihilation, right? And that's the easiest answer to believe if you don't believe in heaven or hell. You don't believe in Jesus as your Savior. When I die, I'm just done, right? And they're okay with that. But it's sad because we as Christians, we know that's not true, right? We, we can turn to the Bible, Gen John chapter 3, verse 16, the most famous passage in all the scripture, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. They wouldn't perish. Perish from what? Perish from an eternity, eternity with the Father. There is a place called hell. Hell was created for the devil and his fallen angels, those who follow him, but also those who reject the free gift of eternal life. So yes, there is life after death, and Jesus wants to spend eternity with you. That's why he sent his son to die on the cross, to give you forgiveness of your sins. So is there life after death? Yes. The third question is more of a tricky question. And maybe many of us in here wrestle with this question, and this is the question that we're going to talk about this morning. What is the meaning of life? What is the purpose of life? You know, as a Christian, we can, we can understand where we came from. God made us, right? He, he just spoke a word, and here we are. We know that there's life after death. Jesus came to die for our sins. We were on our way to hell, right? We were, we were dead to sin, but now we were alive to Christ. He's brought us from, you know, light or darkness into light. So we know that there's life after death. We have the answer to these first two questions. But what about the third question? What is the meaning of life? What was I created for? What is my purpose? What is my purpose? That's life's all-time greatest question. And I have the answer to that question. It's found in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. You guys are going through this on Sundays with Pastor Joe. I'm not sure if you've made it here yet. Um, but listen, this is what Paul, the apostle, says. He says, For by him all things were created, both in heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him. So that's the answer to that first question, right? Where did we come from? Everything has been created through him. What is the meaning of life? What is the purpose of life? We've been, we've been created through him and for him. Amen. That's our purpose. We've been created for him. What does that mean? Okay, we as, we as Christians, believers, we have been created for him. That's our purpose for him. But what does that mean practically? What does that look like on an everyday level? It means that we've been created to worship him. Amen. That's our relationship with the Father, to worship him. You know, at Maranatha Chapel, we have our midweek service. We call it our revive service. We have it every Wednesday night. Um, you know, it's much smaller than our weekend services. It's midweek. Um, but we have a lot of youth that come, you know. And uh, once a month, the first Wednesday of every month, we have our revive worship night. And, and this is a very... Um, it's a very intimate setting where people come. You know, we have hundreds of people that come, and it's just a night of just worship, and it's beautiful. You see people that, you know, their hearts are just broken and open, and their hands are lifted high, and they're singing, they're praising, they're, they're on their knees, they're, they're laying prostrate. You know, God is moving. The Spirit of God is moving. It's, it's really such a, a neat thing to see as our worship team is just leading the church into worship before the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the God Almighty, you know, and, and like I said, it's a beautiful sight, but it also got me thinking. We have these worship nights the first Wednesday of each month. So does that mean we only fulfill what we were created for 12 times a year during these worship nights? I hope not. Because if I was created for him, if I was created to worship I want to worship God every second of every single day. Amen. But listen, you're not going to find me in Target during a Tuesday in the middle of the aisle with my eyes closed, my hands lifted high singing, you are Jaira. You know why? Because I can't sing. That would be embarrassing. 
I'd probably turn a lot of people off to Jesus. Is that what God is expecting of us? But I do want to worship Jesus every second of every single day. But how do I do that without scaring people off with my voice? So what's the definition of worship? What's the definition of biblical worship? That's the question that we're going to look at this morning. You know, and I believe that all Christians, for that matter, I believe that all creation, all humans, they were designed to worship something, and they are worshiping something. If you're not worshiping God, if you're not worshiping Jesus, and he's not in that spot of worship for you, you're worshiping something else. Whether you want to admit it or not, you're worshiping something else. Jesus alone belongs in that spot of worship who you give your attention to, who, who, is, who is the passionate one of your life, right? And in the modern church, worship is a very common word amongst Christians. You know, I bet in the next week or so, you will probably have a conversation with other believers that involves worship, right? Or maybe you'll hear on the radio, this is the, the new worship song by Phil Wickham. You know, house of the Lord, right? And that's worship. That, that's what we think when we, when we hear the word worship. And the truth is, worship should be a foundational piece for you and for me as a child of God, as a believer. But what is it? If I was created to worship, created for him, what is worship? And taking a step back and looking at a 30,000-foot 30, view of the church, generally speaking, I believe, and I'll put myself in there, I believe that most Christians, most churches, have an inaccurate or an incomplete view of what biblical worship is. The worship that we oftentimes understand is not the correct biblical definition of worship. Case in point, when I was a new believer, I got saved in, in high school around uh, 17, 18 years old, um, and, you know, what was very kind of popular back then was sort of a, it was kind of a Christian Woodstock. It was called Spirit West Coast. And many of our friends were, you know, wanting to go to Spirit West Coast. And it was up in Monterey at that time. And I went to a few. It was an amazing time. But listen, this is, this is their tagline to describe their event, Spirit West Coast. This is on their website. It says, the heartbeat of Spirit West Coast is to bring people together to worship God and have fun with one another while enjoying the top worship leaders in Christian music. You see, I think this is a good description, a good generalization of what Christians think about worship, that it's somehow tied to music. And don't get me wrong, it is tied to music, but it's so much more. If I ask all of you your idea, hey, what is worship? What would you say? Maybe, oh, it's, it's Phil Wickham. I love this. I love his new song or Third Day or Mercy Me or Maverick City Worship. All, all of those guys, right? If you, if you would have asked me when I was a new Christian, worship is this. It's these guys leading us in song. That's worship. And I don't want to take anything away from those worship artists. I mean, we, have, we had some gifted you know, believers up here that were leading us into the very presence of God through Worship through music and praise God for them. But worship is so much more than just music. Yes, it's music. Yes, it's song. The writer of Hebrews writes in chapter 13, verse 15, he says, Let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But let me just say that music is just a drop in the music bucket. It's just a slice of the music pie. It's so much bigger than that. Did you know that the word worship comes from an old English word that means worth-ship? Worth-ship. It means to ascribe worth to someone or something. So we worship God because he is worthy. That's why we worship God. We worship God. God is worthy of our worship because of who he is and what he does. And our desire as believers, saved by the blood of Jesus, should be to worship God because he is worthy of it. God is worthy of our worship. And did you know what? That is also God's desire. God desires you to worship him. Not in a narcissistic sense, not in an elitist sense. But in John it says, But the hour is coming and is now here 
when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. So God is seeking worshipers. So here we are, right? We want to worship God, but what does that look like? What does that look like? John just said that the worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth, which means that there's, there's a false worship that's going on. There's a false worship that's going on, sadly, amongst believers today. What is that false worship? What does my worship look like? I don't want to be involved in false worship. I don't want to give God false worship. I believe that everyone in here, we want to give God true and authentic worship. What is that worship? This God-honoring worship. And, and again, this message, it's not meant to be condemning at all. You know, this message is more to me than it is probably to, to, to all of you in this room. This message is rather meant to be challenging. It's meant to encourage us to engage in God-honoring true biblical worship. So what worship am I giving to God? Is it true worship or is it false worship? So again, the title of this message is For Him. We've been created for Him. We've been created to worship. We just read in John chapter 4, 23 that God's looking for those that would worship Him in spirit and in truth. And it's our desire to worship Him in spirit and in truth. So we're going to look into God's Word to see what it says about worship because God's Word is truth, right? Yeah. Side note, if you guys ever have any questions about anything your best answer is to open up God's word. Because Jesus said, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So if you want to find truth to life's answers, you look in the book of truth. You look into God's word. So tonight or today, we're going to look into God's word to see what true worship is. And as we're going to look into worship, you guys have a very... Uh, intelligent pastor. And this is something that a lot of biblical scholars refer to. It's a principle called the law of first mention. You know, Joe maybe ha has talked about this before, but the law of, have you guys ever heard of law, the law of first mention? So the law of first mention is a biblical principle that essentially says to understand a word or a doctrine in scripture, you need to go back and look at the very first place that it was mentioned you need to study the passage. You need to look at the context. You need to figure out the interpretation of it in order to find the fundamental inherent meaning of that word or doctrine. So the law of first mention, it essentially says that the meaning of a word or a doctrine, the first time it's used in Scripture, sets a precedent every single time that it's used then after. So if you look at the word repent and you study repent, every single time the Bible uses the word repent, it's going to mean the same exact thing at its root meaning. It's not going to change. It's not going to vacillate. So we want to look at worship. Where was worship used the very first time in Scripture? We read about worship. We, we read about this word worship and what it is a lot in the New Testament. But did you know that the word worship was actually used in the very first book of the Bible? In the book of Genesis. We're going to take a look at that, the law of first mention. And it's used in the book of Genesis. And when God divinely inspired this, this word the first time, it was used in the context of the story of Abraham. You know, we know what was going on here in this story. We don't really have too much time to get into it, but it was used um, with Abraham, this, this great patriarch. He was known as the father of faith. Abraham was known as the man of faith. Why? Because he believed God. When God told him something, he believed what God said in spite of everything that Abraham had going on against him. He believed God what he said. In Genesis chapter 15, you don't have to turn there. You can flip to Genesis 22. We're going to be looking at a couple passages in Genesis chapter 22. But in Genesis chapter 15, we read that God appeared to Abraham, the great patriarch, and he told him that he was going to make him a father of many nations, right? Remember, he took him out. He said, look at the, look at the stars in the sky. If you're, able to, if you're able to number them, I'm going to make you, you know, a father of many nations more than, right, the stars that are in the sky. But the problem was that Abraham didn't have any children. If you want to be a father to many nations, or if you want to be a father, guess what? You have to have kids, right? Abraham didn't have kids. You need kids 
or you need kids to be a father. And do you know how old Abraham was when, when God came to him and told him that he was going to make him a father of many nations? 35? 40? That's pretty old, right? 50? No, he was 90 years old when Abraham heard this word from God. He was 90 years old. I'm going to make you a father of many nations. And in order for that to happen, you have to have kids, Abraham. You see, that's a problem. <laughs> because you don't have to have a PhD in anatomy and physiology to know that 90 years is past childbearing years. Can I get an amen for that? <laughs> you know, when I'm 90 years old, I'm not going to be trying to make any kids. I'll be lucky if I make it to the restroom in the middle of the night, you know? <laughs> But yet, God told Abraham that he was going to make him a father of many nations. And Abraham believed. And that's why he was known as the father of faith. He believed God. You know, and there's a lot more to the story that we can read about. For time's sake, we're not going to. But you can, you know, for homework, you can kind of, you know, brush up on this story, Genesis chapter 15, um, and just read what's going on. But ultimately, God's promise was fulfilled. God gave Abraham this promised child, which was a miracle. You know, after the story of, you know, Hagar and Ishmael, the child of the flesh, right? He tried to help God out. But God came through on his promise. And at the ripe old age of 100, and Sarah was 90 years old, the promised child Isaac was born. He was miraculously born. Can you imagine that? Being 90 years old, giving birth to a son? But finally... You know, Isaac was the promised son whom God was going to bring about his promise to Abraham. It was through this child that Abraham would become the father of many nations, ultimately bringing forth the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. Listen, you had better believe that Abraham was going to do everything he could to protect and watch over his son at all costs. Because God's promise in making him a father of many nations, it would only become realized, listen, if Isaac had kids who had kids who had kids and so on. That's why we commonly refer the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. And before Isaac even ever had any kids, before the promise of God was even possible, I want us to take a look at what happens in Genesis chapter 22. So open up Genesis chapter 22. We're going to start in verse 1. And it says, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. I mean, could you imagine what was going through Abraham's mind when God is speaking this to him? That's my greatest fear. Something happening to my kids. I, as a father, told my daughter and my son, I will protect you. I will take care of you. I will never let anything bad happen to you. That's my greatest fear. And this is God coming to Abraham and telling him, it's time to kill your son. The son that he miraculously gave him, it's time to kill your son. You would think that Abraham would say, wait, what? Why would you say that, God? You supernaturally gave me a son, Isaac, to bring about your promise, and now you're telling me to kill him? To forget about the promise? I don't understand this. What's going on? Listen, that would have been my response. That would, that would have probably been your response as well. But that wasn't Abraham's. His response is found in the next few verses. And again, this story is in the context of the first use of the word worship. Listen to Abraham's response. Genesis chapter 22, starting in 3 to verse 5. It says, So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told them. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes afar and saw the place, saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. Listen, the lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. 
This is the first time that the Bible uses the word worship. That's the law of first mention. Everything that we should know about worship is found in this passage. So now that we know about worship and what it really means, right, we can close up our Bibles, we can call it a day, we can go grab some lunch, right? Many of you guys are like, wait, I still don't understand what worship is. What, what is the biblical definition of worship? What, what, is, what does it mean? That's because the description of worship is found in what happens in the next few verses. So let's take a look. Genesis chapter 22 Verse 5, it says, And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. Verse 6, So they began their trek up the mountain with a cajon made of acacia wood, an original Gibson Les Paul the Apostle guitar in hand, and they began their sound check when they reached the summit. <laughs> they then entered into a worship session that went into the early hours of the morning before heading back down to the mountain. That's the biblical definition of worship. Why is everyone laughing? Is that not what your Bible says? No, it's not what my Bible says either. You know, when we, when we hear worship, that's often what we think, right? And if it did say that, if it, if it literally said that, we would be okay with it. Like, yeah, they went up to the mountain to worship and to play some songs and to come back down, right? But that's not what happened. Look at what happened. Look, what did their worship session consist of? Verse 6. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. This is a testing that we're reading about here. This testing is a testing of sacrifice. It's also the first time that the Bible uses the word love. The law first mentioned. And it's interesting that the first picture of what real love looks like is described in the context of a father and of a son, of Abraham and Isaac and the special relationship that they shared. Listen, let me ask you this question. How do you think Abraham felt when God told him to kill his son? What was going through his mind? What was his emotional state? You see, it doesn't say. It's not recorded for us because in the end, Abraham's feelings, they were irrelevant. It didn't matter how he felt about it because God wanted obedience. He wanted obedience. And that's important for us to remember because the life of faith is not lived in the realm of the emotions. The life of faith is lived in the realm of the will. You know, I guarantee you that Abraham did not feel like killing his son. But he was going to follow through. He was going to do it. Do you know why? Because his emotions were not his Lord. And too many of us today are confused by this. That our trust in God and our love for God is somehow determined or swayed by what's going on around us. Like, you know, if you wake up and things are going well, right? There's food on the table. You're still getting a paycheck. You're not late on rent. You know, you're, you know, you're just blessed, right? You're like, man, God, you are so good. You are my provider. I trust you. I love you. But what happens when the rug gets pulled from under you? Do you still trust God? God, thank you so much. You are my provider. I will trust in you. Or God, I love you so much today because I feel good, Right? Things are going well. I woke up on the right side of the bed. But can you say that when something tragic happens? Because that is not faith. Faith is not an emotional state. Faith is an action of the will. Faith is a volitional response, and faith is a choice. Listen, you choose to believe, and you choose to obey takes responsibility. And we are guilty of making our emotions our Lord sometimes. And Satan wants us to fall into that trap, driven by how we feel, driven by you know, what people you know, are saying, and, oh, I need to do this because they feel this way, or that's their opinion. We, we need not be swayed by that. Making choices by how we feel and not by what God says or by what, by what his word clearly tells us 
Did you know that your faith is precious to God? Your faith is precious to God. 1 Peter writes in 1 Peter 1 verse 7 that the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So God is willing to test your faith because he knows the power that faith can bring in the life of a believer. And it's true. God will send test your ways, right? He'll send you through the valleys. But remember, who's with us in that valley? God is with us, right? His rod and his staff, they comfort us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. But a faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. And so Abraham's faith was tested. He became the father of faith because it was tested and he passed the test. So we, right here in Genesis chapter 22, we are essentially reading Abraham's, this great patriarch, we're reading his testimony, and it's a powerful testimony of God's provision and God's faithfulness. Listen, a test will always precede a testimony. And if it was true for Abraham, it's true for us. And if you're going through a test today, this morning, God is turning your test into a testimony. He's turning your mess into a message for the people. Share it. Don't keep it to yourself. Look at it in verse 10. It says, And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. The original text here communicates that he was actually in the process of coming down with the knife to slaughter his son. Abraham was willing to do that. Verse 11, But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. So how does this story fit in with life's all-time greatest question? What was I created for? You were created for him. You were created to worship him. And we see here from this story that worship is much more than just music. It's more than raising our hands and lifting our voices. In fact, the only melody that I hear in Abraham's story in his worship session is the melody of surrender, of his will, the melody of obedience, of action, of actually willing to kill his son. You see, Abraham chose to worship God despite how he felt because God is worthy of that worship. He's worth-ship. So even on a practical level, when you guys come in here to worship through song and you don't feel like worshiping, guess what? It doesn't matter how you feel. God is still worthy of your worship. So worship him. But listen, the backdrop of their worship session, there was no lights. There was no drums, no fog machine, no guitar, no skinny jeans. No preacher sneakers, if you guys have heard of those. Not that they're all bad, right? But his worship session, the backdrop, included an altar, a knife, a father, and a son. And the New Testament gives us a unique insight into what was going on inside Abraham's mind during this testing of his son. When God told him, it's time to kill your son, Abraham. Hebrews 11, 19 which you know, is commonly referred to as the hall of faith. It says, Abraham, listen, reasoned that God was able to raise Isaac up even from the dead. Now that's a man of faith. He, he understood, he knew that he who promised was faithful. God told him something, God was going to do it, even if that meant raising his son from the dead. God was still going to be faithful to his Word. You see, what mattered for Abraham was obedience. It was to follow through, to do what he did not feel like doing. That's what God is requiring of us. He's asking of us. Now, I don't know what that looks like for you this morning individually, and I trust that the Holy Spirit is kind of dropping little pointers in each one of your lives, right? And showing you, you know, where, where these, these areas of your life, they need surrender or obedience or things that you have not let go of that God is asking you to let go of. 
But God is looking for a life that is surrendered to his lordship. That is what it means to worship God. It's not just coming and singing and lifting your hands. And almost 2,000 years later, this exact scene in this same location would play out again with a different father and a different son. And this time, the father was going to follow through with the execution of his son. And because of what happened, the very act that took place on Mount Calvary, the death of Jesus who bled for you and for me, because of this, we have been set free from sin. We've been set free from shame, guilt. We've been set free from death. We've been set free from hell. And we've been given a place in glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. That's God's grace. That's something that we can earn or deserve. That was the free gift of God. And that is why he is worthy to be worshipped. I want to leave you with, with a song. Um, I'm not going to sing it because I already did that a little earlier. <laughs> don't want to scare you. But this is a song that uh, Matt Redmond sang. It's called Heart of Worship. And I just want to kind of read through you know, uh, a, a few of the you know, lines in the song because really um, it, it wraps up this entire message into a song. So as I read through these, just listen, let it, let it, you know, just, just meditate upon these things and, and, and receive them. Um, and it goes like this. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. So the answer to life's all-time greatest question, what was I created for, is you were created to worship. You were created for him. And that doesn't mean just singing. It means singing, of course. But it means so much more than that. It means you live a life of worship. There was a famous philosopher who once said, Jesus, take the wheel. Maybe that was a pop star. (laughs) But Jesus, take the wheel. A life of worship is one that says yes to God even when your feelings say no. That is true worship, and that is what God is seeking. That that is what God deserves because he's worthy of it. So your life as a worshiper, as a believer, your life should be marked by two things, surrender and obedience. Surrender and obedience. And listen, if your life is not marked by surrender and obedience, then maybe we shouldn't be lifting our hands up in church. You know, I'm talking to myself here. Because God wants more than just lifted hands. He wants a surrendered heart. The worship team can come on up and get ready. But listen, the Bible says that Christ, that Jesus, he became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Listen, Jesus did not feel like going to the cross. How do we know that? Because he prayed in the garden, right? If there's any other way to redeem mankind, to bring them back to you, to save them from their sin, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to go to the cross. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Here we see that Jesus worshiped the Father through surrender and obedience. And if Jesus did this, how can we offer him anything less? We can't. Paul writes in Romans chapter 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Let's pray. So Father, we thank you, Lord, for 
this morning. We thank you for your word, Father. We thank you, Lord, for um, you know, just allowing us to look into your heart, Father, to see what you desire, Lord. That true worship is more than just singing. It's more than just raising our hands, Father, but it's, it's, it's saying yes to you. It's loving you with everything that we have, our body, our soul, our heart, our mind. And Lord, I pray, God, that as each person in here was open to to receiving from you this morning, God, we pray that if there is any area in our lives that you've kind of pinpointed, Jesus, that this is something that we need to give up. Lord, something that we need to turn away from or maybe something that, that you've called us to do that we're not doing, Jesus. A life of worship is, is a life that says yes to you and no to self, Jesus. So please, you know, just help each one of us in here honor you and give you the worship that you are worthy of, Lord, the worship that you are due. Lord, thank you for every single person in this room, and I pray that you would just fill them afresh with your Holy Spirit, God, that you would help them, Father, to to live out this calling, what it means to be a worshiper of you, Jesus, not just here in church, but throughout their week, Lord, because you've given them spears of influence, Jesus, to, to uh, to make your name great, Jesus. So we pray that you would equip them to walk worthy of of the calling, Lord, with which we were called. God, we thank you. We praise you. We love you. Just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.